Okay, so we're going to keep plugging on now. Now what we want to do is we want to start getting some calibration in there. Okay? So we're going to talk about how we can do that. We're going to actually create and configure a calibrate, um, a calib endpoint um, tool. Um, and we're also going to talk about the checkerboard calibration. We're not going to implement it, but we are going to actually talk about it. Uh, and then we're going to see what happens, because now we're going to take a caliper tool afterwards and actually get the measurement of what the camera body is um, and get it in real-world numbers, because right now we have it in pixels. And what does it really mean to be 108 pixels? Nothing. I mean, you could say, well, if I have a 640 by 488 camera, that's about a sixth of my field of view, you know, so whatever my field of view is, I can figure that out. But that's going to change depending on how far up your camera is, whether it's skewed or not, what lens you're using. So let's get this into real world coordinates. So let's talk about the Calib endpoint to endpoint tool first. So what it's going to do is it's going to calculate a 2D transform so that you can get those real world coordinates out of it. Now remember, since we're doing a calibration, we are adding to the space tree. Okay, so we're going to create a user space to go up into our tree. So we can decide where we want our home position to be. You know, so if we're using a robot, we can say, hey, you know, where is that home position for the robot? Now, does every application require calibration? You should ask that first. Yes. No. no, no. There are two types of applications that require calibration. Can anyone tell me what they are? Measurement and guidance, exactly. Measurement, it's a relative thing. So where my origin point is doesn't really matter. As long as I have it set up and it's calibrated correctly, I'm going to be able to measure from one point to another and get the real world coordinates. But if I'm using guidance, robotic guidance type thing, that where that origin point is becomes very important because it's an absolute. So you have to know where your distance is from that point to be able to get the information back. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to end up setting up our calibration. We're going to decide where our offset point is. Um, and then we're going to be able to read in real world units. Now, uh, it's usually done on another part other than what you're inspecting. Okay? It's usually some type of ideally machined item. This could be a calibration plate. This could be a calibration block. Um, not often is it done on the actual part, though we're going to break that and we're going to do it on the part. Okay. Now, a couple things you need to know with your calibration plate. Um, you need to be able to um, find certain points. And the number of points that you're going to try to find is going to depend on the degrees of freedom that you want to calculate. You know, are you doing transformation? Are you doing skewing? Are you doing perspective distortion? Also, we suggest that it occupies 50 to 70% of the field of view. That's because you want to make sure that you're picking it up all over where your lens is. Now, Yes, of course, in our lab, we're not quite going to be doing that, so we're, we're faking it a little bit. Uh, but I should state, at a minimum, it should be in the area that you're doing your calculation. If you're not doing your calculation on the outside of your image, don't worry about trying to get that fed in. It's not going to matter, okay, because you're not measuring out there. So let's say that we have a calibration block, and we know exactly what its dimension is. So we know that it's 100 by 100 millimeters. Knows that it's always that. So what we need to do is we need to find those corners. Now, what might be a good way to find those corners? Sure. I could find this line, could find this line, and then what tool I would use? Intersection. An intersection tool, yeah. Unfortunately for this one, I've got to change this, this uh, slide. They use. Patmax, which is an absolutely horrible way to go about it. Okay, so when they they go to do it, they're going to do the Patmax. Any idea why Patmax would be horrible in this situation? There's actually two reasons. It's using skew. No, not so much skew because we're trying to find that point. One reason was one of the reasons why you would use SearchMax. Patmax is not exactly the greatest with open shapes, so a corner is kind of an open shape, you know. And the second thing is where that actual point is. So you're deciding where that origin point is. Is that truly where that origin point is? Is that truly where the lines are intersecting? Eh, depends on where you put that origin point. So it's not, it, you're finding a 2D item and basing it off that one point. So this is where I'm saying, Pat Max might not be the most ideal. But doing the line line intersect, yes, that's going to exactly find where those things are, are intersecting each other. So then we would need to add the Calib endpoint to endpoint to the tool. So here, what we have is, like I said, they're using the Patmax one. Just say that they're using some mechanism to find those corners. 
Okay, and then they're going to feed that information into your Calib endpoint to endpoint. So all of them should use the same input image. Okay, they should not be picking from different input images. They should all be using the same input image so that you can compare apples to apples. Then it's just a matter of uh, the Calib endpoint for endpoint by default gives you three points. So you need to feed them in. Now this is where it becomes very, very critical. Make sure you're matching the right X and Y with the, the correct one down here. If you start matching maybe your um, upper left hand X with lower left corner Y, it's going to throw this completely out of whack. So you have to be very, very careful how you're hooking things up. Now within your calibration itself, when you open it up, you need to make sure that you say grab calibration image so it brings it in there. And it's going to show you the points that it's found. And it's going to um, show what they were uncalibrated over here. If you need to add more points, just go up to the upper left hand corner. You can um, click that and it will allow for you to have more points. In fact, we're going to do four. So I'm going to show you how to add another point. The next step, very, very important as well, is saying what the raw calibrated uh, um, coordinates are. So you have found where they are in the pixel world. You need to state what they are in the real world. This is another place you can definitely mess yourself up. So make sure you are putting the correct coordinate into each of those points, what they are relative to the real world. Uh, you also decide what your degrees of freedom is. And that's how it checks, hey, am I getting the right amount of points here? You know, what are you really trying to, to calibrate here? You can also go in and change the origin if you need to. So like for robotics or something, if you need to adjust the corn on the um, uh, origin from the upper left hand corner to some other place. You can set that up in there. And you can also go in and show some of your graphics. You know, do you want to show the calibrated axis uh, so that you know exactly where it is on your image of where it found everything from. So it's going to report everything based on that axis. Wouldn't the origin be set based on the raw on the numbers you entered? Usually yes, but you can do an offset from that. So if you know, okay, I found that and those are there, but then my offset's going to be from here for my robot. So it knows how to offset from there. But good point. Now, when you have everything set, just say compute calibration and it's going to go through and it's going to do the transform behind the scenes and it's going to give you some information back. Okay, it's going to tell you what your translations were, what's your scaling, your aspect ratio, any issue, any rotation, and some skewing. And then there's this RMS error. Okay. The more points that you have, the little bit higher that this is, but what's going to happen is if you've really messed this up, it's going to give you an error. It's going to say, whoa, it's too large. Anytime your RMS is too large, go check first that you pick the right points, and second that you put the correct information in underneath the calibrated points, because you've messed something up there. Okay. You're, you're misassociating a point, you're thinking that it's one and it's really another. So go back and check that. Now what you need to do is you need to go back and disable any tool that went into setting up that calibration. Do not disable the calibration. The calibration has to remain enabled because it's letting the image come through it. So it's going to have an output image that you're going to feed to another tool. So you want the image to keep coming through it. If you disable the calibration tool, it's going to get stuck with whatever the last image was that came through it. That's not going to help you. But what happens is, is if you don't disable these, these numbers change the next time you do an inspection. Even though they might be legit, they just change, your calibration becomes disabled. Well, I shouldn't say becomes disabled. It, it becomes wrong. Yes, it says that it fails. So that's why you have to disable them. Now, whether you disable, because we're going to do some line finding tools and then the intersect tools. If you want to disable the line finding tools, you can, just to be complete, just to be kind of OCD about it, just cleaning things up. Uh, why might you want to disable the line finding tools as well? Cleans, up Cleans it up in speed. Now truthfully, doesn't take very long for those things to run, but what if you had some other type algorithms that was taking longer to find them? You could just disable them if they're not being used. Uh, yes and no. 
Uh, since I'm still using the same fixture space that I'm, I'm using with my other tools, all that's going to do is the outputs and any inputs for the tools are going to be real world coordinates now right. instead of calibrated. Since we haven't set any Right, because we're still going to be using the fixtured image. But if you were all of a sudden changing the coordinate space and where the fixturing is and everything, then yes, that could throw it off. Usually they say calibration should come towards the end, but the truth is it really doesn't matter for this. It should come right before you're about to get a good information out. But remember, Vision Pro is already keeping track of everything behind the scenes, so it knows what the root space is, and it's just making the calculations from there. Um, in that sense, that's where I'm saying any inputs are going to be real world coordinates and any outputs. So, yes, it, it could change that. Because one of the things, let me, um, like if we go in and we do, oh, they do a blob here? Okay. Uh, we are going to go in and we're going to do a caliper. Remember how we said edge width and we were saying pixels? It's now looking at edge width to be real world units. So, yes, that could throw things off. Uh, the actual pixels and stuff, I, th I believe it's still keeping those because it knows what they were in real world, so it tries to keep that. Okay. But now anything going into the tool is supposed to be real world coordinates instead of. I did the gradient. You did the gradient? The grid. The grid. It, 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 I had to resize everything. Okay. So yeah, I guess because any of your inputs of what it thinks that it is, it all of a sudden. sudden was tiny compared to the size of the tool. No, I guess it would make sense because if all of a sudden 10 millimeters are sitting there and those might take up let's say 10 millimeters is 100 pixels or something, let's just say, it will throw things off because all of its inputs are expected to be now in real world. Uh, so now your Calib endpoint to endpoint has an output image and now you can feed it to the input image of whatever tool that you have so now that those informations will be coming out in real world coordinates. Then there's this concept of tool blocks and this is a great time to have tool blocks. We actually have this con uh, concept of tool groups and tool blocks. Uh, so what we might have is inside our program, we're going to set up our calibration. And that's great. You know, it's just going to run down into our program. But what we might want to do is we want to have the calibration maybe saved as its own little block, okay? A code that we're just going to reuse over and over again. This might be always how we do our calibration. So the best way to set this up is through an actual block. Now, the difference between tool group and tool block really comes down to how it handles its terminals. Um, engineering would prefer anyone who's starting their applications to go forward with tool blocks because it just makes it easier with its terminals. Um, but if something is done in a tool group, the only difference is that um, when I have my group, I have to feed in what the actual source is. So let me, here's my tool group right here um, that I have going into my um, group. And I'm saying what the terminals are, so I have to go from outside in to grab in what terminals I'm, I'm using. But if I'm using a tool block, notice it gives me these two terminals are always set, so it's very easy if I drop this into my program. I don't have to open up the whole tool and see all the tools underneath it. I just feed it into the actual block. It does the work behind the scenes, and then off I go. It'll make sense when I show it. You're kind of looking at me strange. <laughs> So when you go to create a tool block, it's going to ask you what terminals do you want to create for it. So in our case, we're going to create an input terminal bringing in the image that we're going to use because that's what we need for all the tools that we're going to do our calibration with. And then we need to create an output terminal of an image as well, and that's going to be our calibrated image. We can name it whatever we want to name it. Okay? So our input image, we might say, is our pixel image, you know, and our output image will be our calibrate image. So the tool block that we're going to see is we have an input image here, an output image here. This is what's going to come up to our actual job level. But within the tool block itself, we also have a nice little connection, you know, a little terminal to connect it to, so it never becomes unconnected if we're switching them between tools. All we do is drag, drop it into our next job, connect up the uh, terminals correctly inside the job. You don't have to go back in and change anything here. Good to go. Uh, checkerboard calibration. So we can also do checkerboard calibration as well. What the checkerboard calibration does is it allows for you to have a linear or nonlinear calibration. What it does is it finds the points for you. And this can either be grid of uh, dots or checkerboard. It started with just checkerboard, but they've added grid of dots to it as well. Uh, so what it's going to find is for a checkerboard, it's going to find where all the checkerboards meet on the grid of dots. It's going to find the center of your dot there. So it's going to be able to take out some distortions, some nonlinear distortions. 
So if you look all the way over to the left, there's our undistorted image. But we might have some aspect ratio distortion. That's just a linear distortion. That very often comes with line scan cameras. Moving it too quickly, it um, shrinks up. So we can take that out of it. Or some nonlinear distortion. Okay? Perspective distortion is when you're, I hate calling it perspective distortion. I should call it skew distortion. It's when your camera is not normal to your part. That it's all actually off to the side, so you kind of get the railroad tide effect. Why I try to say it's not perspective distortion, because true perspective distortion is a 3D item coming up towards the camera, where it actually bows away because of the light itself. No, so, that what? Parallax. So that your telecentric lens will take those out. Yes. It's it's um, I when I've talked to them, they've slightly changed it. They call one skewing. They call one. On perspective, okay, and then radio is just that you've kind of got a bad lens, and it's it's making it kind of fisheye pull out a bit. So what we want to do is we want to put this calibration plate. This calibration plate can usually be made of like glass or aluminum. We're going to put this underneath the camera, and with the camera's um, field of view, it's going to take up, pick up where all the points are in the field of view, and then it says, okay, now I know what the transform should look like. So when your actual image goes there, I know how to adjust what the image looks like. I know how to, where it is on the field of view, adjust what it would be in real world coordinates. Now a couple of guidelines on the calibration plate. If you're using the checkerboard, it's got to be black and white tiles. They have to be an alternating pattern. That kind of makes sense. Uh, they need to be the same size, and their aspect ratio cannot be um, outside of the range of 0.9 to 1.1. Okay, so they need to be nice square tiles. Uh, you need to at least get nine of them, okay, within your field of view. The tiles must be at least 15 by 15 pixels, okay? And they say that increasing the number of tiles will improve the accuracy because the more points you get, the better the accuracy you're going to get. Now, if you're using a fiducial on it, you're, what does a fiducial do? gives you an origin as well as axes. Okay? So if you're using the checkerboard fiducial, the um, very long line is going to be your x axis. The short line is going to be your y axis. Um, and where, when you come from the end of them, where they meet, that is your actual origin point. That is 0, 0. This is not a cognic standard. This is an industry standard. But it's just a little bit, you know, taking a look at it, sometimes people don't realize where you get that origin point from. If you are not using a fiducial, it will, if you don't state what it is, it will default choose whatever the point is towards the center of axis of your camera. It says that that's your origin point. It'll default to that. So you'll go in and you'll get your image. So here's one that we purposely made it so that it's skewed out, OK? So we're going to go in there, do we want linear or do we want nonlinear? And then most importantly, we need to say, what's the tile size? You'll notice that it's not asking us units here. That's because the truth of the matter, it doesn't care what the units are. They could be in elephants, doesn't care. All that it cares is these numbers because that's what it's doing. It's doing a mathematical transformation behind the scenes. So it needs to know, OK, you're saying that that's 10 units. I'm saying that I see that as 30 pixels. So let me do the transform behind the scenes. You can also go in, change your origin if you need to. And what it's going to show you is it's going to show you on the image where it found all the dots to be, where it found all the intersections. Now, does anyone have an idea where this red is coming from? Caliper tools? <laughs> let me go back to the original image. That's the original image. That's what you see. This is it undistorted. Because it's going away from us further, so I have more squares in the back than I do in the front. So in order to make it linear, it brings that all in, and it's letting us know this red area over here is, I have no idea what this is. This wasn't inside my field of view. But in order for me to frame up the box, I'm going to write some, you know, put some red in there just so you know. Just so you know. Now, you'll notice it doesn't pick up all the points. Okay? Should you be concerned? You shake your head no. Why not? Uh, I mean, it's got enough points to do the calibration. I mean, there's going to be some distortion of that. It's hard to get images there. The, the true question you need to ask yourself, are you measuring in those areas? If you're not measuring in those areas, then who cares if it's getting the points there? But if you are measuring in those areas, any idea what you need to do now? You better adjust your lighting and optics and everything to get uh, you know, better lighting in there. And, 
and to get it um, so that it's more focused because that's really what's happening is you're starting to up at the top you're starting to come out of focus so it's not quite sure that it's picking up those and in the bottom it's it's kind of not a lot of light. You know, one thing you did in that, you know, actually having these things at the actual front, you know, the front. Ah. I'm going to talk about that in a moment, but the depth of field only keeps it in focus. You need it planar. But yes, your depth of field is going to keep it in focus. So it has an idea. Right, for example, when you, when you set this calibration plan here or here, and you're part of where it's part of it at that level, because obviously it's. Yes, I am going to discuss that in just a moment. Yes, you do need to be at the same plane as the part that you're looking at, most definitely. Um, but in case you have some slight change, this is taking care of that. Um, but um, your depth of field, you do need things to stay in focus. So you're going to get your calibration results. It's going to show you all the vertex points that it got. It's going to tell you what they really were in real world coordinates. Uh, it's going to tell you the information about you know, your coefficients if you want to take a look at it. Now notice that it also gives us our, our RMS. Whenever you're dealing with the checkerboards, I notice that this tends to be much higher than they are on the just like two or three points. When you're in two and three points, you usually get down in the like e to the negative sixth or something like that. Um, but when you're dealing with a large amount of points, you usually get below one. But you're not down in the exponential numbers. It's usually up there because there's so many points it's trying to take into account. Once again, if it goes above one, it's going to tell you your RMS is too high and that you um, not sure what to say that, about that one because that just doesn't make sense because it's already found where the points are. It can't have messed up where the points are. So you might want to think about maybe where you put your, your origin. So what's really going on is it takes a look at what the actual calibration image is. Okay? And so it finds out where those points are. And then behind the scenes what it's taking a look at is it knows what the true grid should be. So anytime that it's in that field of view that it's seeing a point, it says, oh, if I'm seeing a point here, I know that I need to move it a little bit to make it linear. So it knows how to add or subtract the appropriate amount of offset to the point to make it linear within the field of view. So what's going to come out of your um, cog calib checkerboard tool is once again an output image, and the output image is going to feed to the input image of all, any of your other tools. Um, notice I don't have to disable this tool. The reason is, is it will not calibrate unless you go in there and tell it to calibrate. Okay? Otherwise, every time it runs, it's just going to uh, keep whatever the current image is coming into it so that it can output the correct image. So calibration tools can be create, uh, will create a new user space, um, but it's going to give you back the information in millimeter or inches. Endpoint calibration um, allows the user uh, to bring in something of known shape and size where you're finding what the points are. While the checkerboard calibration assumes that you're going to be using a grid, whether this be a, a checkerboard grid or a a grid of dots. So let's try this out. Okay. Like I said, we usually say 50 to 70 percent of the field of view, and this is where we're cheating. We're going to do it off of this back of it. Now these um, plates were actually machine drawn and everything so that they are the size of an insight a micro camera. So the back of a camera is 30 by 30. The um, camera itself is 60 millimeters. Okay? So before I start with my calibration process, what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a tool block because I want to be able to keep all my calibration in one little nice, neat tool block so that I can save that out, put it in my next program, put it in my next one, so I don't have to keep recreating the wheel every single time. So let's do that. I'm going to open up my toolbox. I'm going to look for cog tool block and drop that in to my spreadsheet. I'm going to go ahead and rename this right now. Okay? I'm going to right click, say rename, and I'm going to call this Calib Routine. So I know that it's always going to be my calibration routine. I'm going to open this up, and you notice that here's where my tools are going to be, so it's like a little mini job area, but first I have to set up what my inputs and outputs are. So I'm going to create a new input. So if I just say add new, it's going to ask us, well, do you want a certain system type? Do you want a certain vision pro type, or do you want to go browse for them? We're going to get to the browsing for them when we start getting into scripting. Okay? <laughs> so I'm going to go to my vision pro type, and what I care about is I care about the cog, eight, um, cog image 8 gray. I always say that opposite. Cog image 8 gray.
That's just an 8-bit grayscale image coming in. So I'm going to go ahead and add this, and I'm just going to call it input image. Okay, Just name it an input image. Now notice down on my queue right down here, sorry, that's uh, over here, I want to show, that it already gives me a little input terminal down at the bottom. It's giving me an input terminal. Let me go ahead and add an output terminal. So if I add an output terminal, once again, I'm going to do Vision Pro type is a cog image 8 gray. And I'm going to name this Calib image. And notice that down at the bottom of my job, it has given me a Calib image routine. Now, before I go on for a moment, one of the things I need to do, so I'm just going to shut this for a moment, is where it says my input image, I need to bring in an input image. If I don't link this up already, the tools that I'm about to add aren't going to have an image to work with, so I have to link it up. So where do I want to grab my image from? 50-50. Actually, we want to grab it from Fixtured. Because if the part moves again, we want it to stay with the part so that it's always going to grab those edges around there. Otherwise, it's going to depend on how my part falls underneath the camera. We're going to run it once, but what if I need to go back in and recalibrate? So, so I'm going to do from the calibration image, run once. And so now let me go back into my calib routine. Now, you'll notice that even if I run, there's no image here. That's because there's no tool using an image yet. There is an image sitting there, okay, but it hasn't created any records yet. So that's why I'm not seeing anything over on my right-hand side. So what I have to do is I've got to start adding some tools. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to add some fine line tools. So I'm going to go underneath geometry, and I'm actually going to drop four in right now. Instead of keep going back and grabbing them, I'm going to grab, create four fine line tools. Now, each of my fine line tools are going to link to my input image. Okay, so I'm just going to go ahead and link them all up to my input image so they're using that image that I've just brought into my tool block. Now, if I run it, oh, come on, input image, there we go. Now, if I run it, notice I have an image here because now there's tools in there, they brought it up, and I've created some type of, of record within this tool block. Now, I've got to set them up. Well, this is a time I definitely want to start renaming things because I'm going to get confused really quickly in this exercise. So my first tool, I'm going to go ahead and rename this to be top. So I know that this is my top line. Okay. My next one, I'm going to rename it bottom. Okay. My third one, I'm going to rename it left. And can you guess what I'm going to rename the fourth? Right. You are right. <laughs> Sorry, little pun. So that's, that helps me try to keep in mind what, what I'm trying to find here. So let me go ahead and go into the first one, my top. And my top, I'm going to find my top line. So let me go ahead and dig into this. Bring my fine line down. Go ahead and sit it across here. Bring it over to here. Okay, and I'm going to find that line. So what is my polarity to find that outermost edge of that line? Dark to light, exactly. So if I go ahead and run it, let me take a look at my last run output image to make sure that I do indeed get that correct line, which I do. Beautiful. Okay, that takes care of my top. Let me go down and do the same thing to my bottom. So I open up my bottom. Bring this on down. This time I'm looking for that bottom line, so I'm going to line this up with my bottom. Okay. And what's my polarity for finding that outermost line of my bottom? Not with how I currently have my caliper setting. Light to dark. I could go in and say change the direction and do it, but I'm just purposely trying to so that you're thinking about what's happening and not just blindly setting things up. So let me run that once, take a look at my last run input image, and yes indeed, I am finding the bottom line here. Beautiful. Okay. My left one, 
Let me go into there. Drill on in. And this time I'm going to drag the line down, set it where the edge is on this side, drag this about 90 degrees rotation here. And now what is the caliper settings for this particular tool? Dark to light, exactly. I'm going left to right, so I'm going to do dark to light, run this, make sure that I do indeed have a line on my left-hand side of my part. And the last one I have to set up is right. So I double click on right, do the same type thing. This time I'm going to bring this down once again, rotate it 90 degrees on down. And for this one, what is my caliper settings? Light to dark, very good. So let me go ahead and run that, check to make sure I'm picking up that line, and indeed I am. So now we can see on our image that's sitting inside our tool group, we can see all the lines that it found. Beautiful. Guess what the next step we have to do is? The intersection points, exactly. So I'm going to go back to my toolbox, and I'm going to go down to geometry intersection, and I'm going to do a line, line tool. So cog, intersect, line, line, and drop that in. So one, two, three. I'm going ahead and dropping four in there. Okay. So I'm going to rename these. So my first one is going to be maybe top left, okay. My second one is going to be top right. My third one will be bottom left. And my fourth one will be bottom right, okay. Now, Here's where, because I've named them this way, I can make my life so much easier. Let me first go in and set up all the input images. So they're still being pulled from the input image coming into the tool group. No other image is coming into it, so that's the only one they can use right now. But then there's the actual point. So notice that it gives us line A and line B. So if I'm on top left, this is where life is made so much simpler by renaming things. Line A, I can say link from and grab my top results line. For line B, I would then link from my left results get line. So now I know top left, okay? If I go my top right, what do I link from for line A? Top, yep. Yeah. And what do I link from from top line B? Right, exactly. So just by naming them this, it makes it so much easier for me to grab which lines I want instead of trying to drag and drop all that stuff. I'm grabbing the correct lines and not throwing myself off. So link from bottom and link from right. So if I run all this once, I should see that it does little intersection points right at the corners of my tools. Now notice my, my actual image is beveled there, but it's assuming that those are the points, okay? Which it should be. That's exactly where they should be. So far so good up to this point? Yep. Everyone's hanging with me? So far? <laughs> no one's crying? Not yet? Okay. Now let me put the little power tool in here. So I'm going to go up to my toolbox, I'm going to go to my calibration and fixturing, and I'm going to grab calib endpoint to endpoint tool and drop that in. Now it's going to ask me my input image. Okay, so what input image should I bring in? Well, you could say the only one that's available for it, but it should be the same one that all the other tools that's going into it's using. So I'm going to use my input image coming into it. And then there's these points. So this is where I need to decide where 0, 0 is and what's my axes that I want to use, OK? So where do we want 0, 0 to be? I don't care. 
top left, would everyone agree? <coughs> top left of what I'm doing here is going to be my zero, zero point. Okay. Um, so that's going to be zero, zero. And where do I want my axes to go? X across, Y down, or X across, Y up, or X across, Y down? As long as we all agree with that. Because this is where you get yourself into a lot of trouble. So if we say x across, y down, as long as we agree with it, we're good. Okay. So we're going to say that this is point 0, point 0, 0.1, point 0.2, point 0.3. Okay. Just so we all agree, 0, 1, 2, 3. Just go around clockwise. And is that because of the definition, or are we just defining it that way? We're defining it that way so that we make sure we're putting the right point and the right label with it. That's where, otherwise, this is where this goes nuts. So we have to think in our mind, what do we want it to be? We can do it however, as long as we got it in our mind, so we get it right. You could go zero, one, two, three, if you want. But you need to keep it straight. That's the most important here, is keeping it straight. So if this top point is zero, zero, so that would be point x, zero, y, zero. So that one would be pulling from which one? top left. So top left x would go to my x point and it would link to the top left y for my y point. Okay. For point 1, okay, where am I linking from for point 1? Top right. top right x. Yep. And once again y1 would be linking to top right y. Now for point 2, where am I pulling from? Bottom right, yes. So bottom right x and bottom right y. Okay. Now, wait, we need one more point. We don't have one more point. We need one more point. What's up with this? Well, let's check it out. So I'm going to go into my calibration tool. I mean, it doesn't matter if I run it. I could run it right now. It's still going to fail. I'm going to go into the tool. Now, notice by default, it gives me three points. If I need to add another point, I just go in there and I click it and it adds me another point here. So now I need to go back and attach it. It didn't create me my terminals. What's up? I need to attach it. It doesn't automatically add terminals for this. So what I need to do is I need to right click on my cal Calib endpoint to endpoint, say add terminals, and it comes up here and it shows you these terminals. Now it has some different categories. You have typical, expanded, and all, okay? We're going to stay with typical right now. Just for this one, we can get away with typical. So what I want to do is I want to see what some of these parameters, um, what this is, and these are probably, they're either calibration, so if I open up the calibration, I see these get uncalibrated. Well, it doesn't say get, it says set, okay? So if it's not get, let's pull down the, oh, okay, we have some set. So this is a set uncalibrated, point zero, one, two. Oh, there's my three. So looking the same as these other ones, except for I haven't brought out x3 yet, I'm going to say add it as an input. So now it just added x3 down there. I want to do the same for y3, okay? Add it as an input. So now I have those connections for that other point. So now I can just go in there and link from, in this case, what is it going to be? Bottom left, Bottom left. yep. Bottom left X and bottom left Y. So now we have all the points that we need. Okay. Now comes the fun. You ready for this? I wish I could pull this down a little bit so you can see all at once. Okay, so now we've got to say what they are in real world coordinates. So that top left one, what should it be in real world coordinates? Zero, zero. Okay. Or point one, what should that be in real world coordinates? 30, zero. 30, zero. I've gone 30 in the x direction, nothing in the y direction. So I'm going to change this to be 30 and zero. Okay. Now, my point two, what is that going to be? 30, 30. Because I've gone 30 in the x direction, 30 in the y direction to get down to this point right here. And then finally, what's the last point? Zero, 30. Exactly. Done nothing in the x direction. 30 in the y direction. Okay. Now I also have to go ahead and tell it to say grab a calibration image. 
so that if I go in and I look at my calibration image, notice it has given me my little, my little dots there. Okay. Now, right now, I'm looking for scaling, aspect, rotation, skew, and translation. Sure, I've got enough dots for that. Not a problem. Okay. Now, my origin right now, I believe if I look at my current input area, does it? Oh, let me run once. Oh, I have to compute my cal calibration first and then run once. You'll notice that if I look at my output image, it has given me my little origin right there. If I needed to change this around, I could, but I'm setting it right off. Remember we said that upper point was 0, .00. That's where we're setting it off of. Uh, I'm just doing an endpoint calibration. That's my name space, and it's creating a calibrated space. I can say what I want to show or not. You know, do I want to show the uncalibrated axes? Do I want to show the calibrated axes? Uh, show the raw. Does that even show anything? Eh. Uh, it doesn't show if it's not calibrated. Okay. And then our results. So my RMS error is about 0.58. Not shocked. <laughs> it's not really well high, but it's, it's, there's a little bit of distortion over there. Now what we want to do is we have it calibrated. Notice we have it calibrated and we ran it once, so it was successful. What we need to do now is what? Dis not disable the calibration. We disable the tools going into the calibration. Because if I go out here and I run this, watch what happens to my calibration routine. If I run this, it disables. It, it becomes bad. Because I just have a new set of tools that just went into it. So I've got to compute my calibration again, run the tool again to get it to be successful. Okay. So yes, now what I want to do is go into each of these, the intersection tools, and I'm going to right click and deselect enabled. Right click, deselect enabled. Right click, deselect enabled, and the final one, right click, deselect enabled. I could go on up and disable these as well. It's not going to gain me a ton of time, so I'm not that worried about it. But do not disable your calibration tool. The final thing I need to do here is take my output image and feed it to my calibrated image. Okay? So that now in my tool group, when I run this once, tool group runs successfully, everything looks good, and what's sitting out there um, on my uh, tool block routine is my calibrated image. is sitting out there. To test it, let's try. Let's take a caliper tool, okay, and let's measure Stop, stop, stop. Let's measure across the body of my part. So I'm going to go ahead, bring up my tool group, bring my cog caliper tool in, drop that off. Grab, where should I get my input image? Now notice if I say link from, I now have three different images I can use. Which one do I want to bring from? Yep, the calibre routine calib image. Yep. Go ahead and run it once. Let's go into the tool itself. And you'll notice that it, it does get a little bit bigger than it was before, and it puts it off to the, the um, side because my zero, zero point's right there. So let's just kind of bring this into here, dial into the image. And what I want to do is I want to make my caliper basically just go across my actual camera body. Now, I probably don't want to put it right across here. Any idea why I probably don't want to put it across there? I'm going to be picking up a lot of edges. Now, I, I could do you know, scoring and everything and make sure I don't, so if that's your only choice. But since we have this beautiful black space above it, why wouldn't I use that? You know, it just seems stupid not to. Now, what am I looking for, single edge or edge pair? Edge pair, yep, I'm going from this edge over to this edge. Uh, my first polarity, what should it be? Uh, my arrow's going left to right. Light to dark. Yes, I'm doing inside, not outside. Inside. So I'm going light to dark. And then my edge one polarity? Dark to light. Yep. Now notice that if I run it, because I'm only looking for one result right now, if I run it, notice I don't get any results. Okay. 
just don't get it. Any idea why not? Right now it's looking for 10 millimeters. Okay, so you might say, well, how big is this? I happen to know it's like 45 millimeters, but let's just say I throw, I'm not totally sure. Okay, maybe I say, hey, well, this is 30 millimeters and this is a little bit bigger than that. Let me just say 30 and see what happens. And if I run it, notice it finds something here. Okay, it says it's 45. Notice my score is really low. So what I could do is say, oh, that's what it really should be. It's about 45 millimeters. So I'm just going to change this to be 45, run it, and notice now I get the same result, but my score is way up there because now I've dialed it in to be what it really is. Or you can go get a measurement, a ruler out, and find out what it is. That should be the dimensions of your good one. Okay, should be at 45 to 46 millimeters. Now let's go ahead and see what it um, returns when I put the bad one there. So flip that up, turn that over, and it's telling me that I'm at 43 millimeters. Because what we've done is we've given you some extra white space on there. So it shrinks it down to be about 43 millimeters. You guys should be reading about the same dimension I'm reading. Because we're using precisely machined parts here. And what is it, uh, what's the units it's measuring in? Millimeters. Measuring in millimeters. Should you ever use an image that's already been taken before on your camera for calibration? Absolutely, exactly. Absolutely not. You should always be using the actual live image coming from your actual um, uh, your environment. Uh, as to what you were saying um, about the the actual distance from it, yes, you should also um, always put your calibration plate at the same plane as the part that you're looking for. Because think about it, if I have my hand sitting out away from my face and I bring it closer to my face, did that change the size of my part? It's larger in field of view. It's larger in my field of view, but it didn't change its size. Now one way to get around that would be telecentric lenses, because telecentric lenses do keep um, that from happening. Uh, but if but telecentric lens keeps that you have to have a small part. Uh, now some people have asked, well, what if I have a 3D part and I've got varying heights? Well, we're, this is not a 3D system. We do have Vision Pro 3D. It's not a 3D system. We're still doing 2D. So you could have a different calibration for each of those heights. And depending on what you're inspecting, you use the appropriate calibration for that inspection. Or the other thing you could do is if you don't need tight, tight, tight accuracy, split the difference put the calibration plate in between the two levels, and so it would be the same inaccuracy on both sides. But then you can stay with one calibration.